What was the importance of the movements that began in the 60s as they relate to today? Everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of what we take for granted today, um, and it can be almost any sector. We were talking earlier about local food production, organic uh, food, uh, just as one example, health and spirituality, looking to Eastern religion and meditation. Um, these are the larger cultural uh, trends, but also uh, if you're into the show, you'll see the first electric car sharing program, <laughs> 1974. Sharing is caring. Yeah, uh, in Amsterdam and not, you know, not Zipcar today. So yeah, you'll see the um, beginnings of the personal computing revolution that everyone takes for granted because of Apple and Microsoft and people like that. They were on the periphery of the counter culture much younger at that time, but the whole notion that hippies were actually doing most of the mainframe programming, working with and not very happily with the military and with the government, um, dreaming of the idea that computers could be used by people, which is something we absolutely take for granted today, but was a radical notion back then in the 1960s. So it's really every sector, and especially here in the Bay Area, is the, really the epicenter of this movement and its impact that's still being felt today. So all the tech industry, um, entrepreneurial culture comes out of there, libertarian values, of course, left values as well, um, and the mix of the two. It's everything. I think it's everywhere. Yeah, it's a huge, like the old uh, deadhead motto, we are everywhere. <laughs> right, right. And there's different, different hippies, different histories of the counterculture as well, which um, people here should probably remember. A lot of this history was rewritten in the 1980s under Reagan and Thatcher, under a conservative movement. So a lot of the stereotypes and cliches or the bad press around the counterculture was largely written in and reinforced um, during that time. Like and propaganda style. Well, rewriting history, history by the victors, right? And so um, a lot of that is now being dismantled and re-examined in the light of all these advances. So um, while the counterculture was, you know, said to be a failure, it actually is very much more successful, and we're feeling the effects of that today even. I love it. Thank you for pointing that out. And you're leading right into my next question, too. In the 60s, they promoted a non-conformist lifestyle. Well, to what were they so opposed to conforming? Well, a lot of it was reacting against um, really the success of um, post-war America, uh, what they called, what they were calling back then a post-scarcity society, believe it or not. The idea that there could be enough food, enough goods, enough everything for everyone. Um, and the U.S. is a major superpower, really the only superpower after World War II, changed the whole notion of what was possible. Um, but the younger generation within, within that, so the, the children of the, of the war, the Great War generation, had a different uh, approach to how society and culture should be valued and how life would be valued. So they basically created uh, everything for a new lifestyle in the best sense of that word. How, how should we live differently? How should we dress differently? How, the music that we listen to, the politics as well, of course, a big part of that, the social values and the value system, all of that is part and parcel of a whole new approach that, again, we're still living with. Mm, it, it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like connected to the system, the culture, the way it was, well, and they were going to create yeah. their own. Yeah, there was a lot of, you know, is, is life determined by having 2.5 kids in a suburb working for a major corporation that was not considered a viable or desirable path for a lot of young people. So it's, there had to be another option. Mm. So what tangible alternatives do you feel that they offered to our current way of life? Well, I think one of the most important things that the counterculture did was um, it modeled or what I call prototyped the possible. Um, and that, I think, is one of the major contributions. So the subtitle shows the struggle for utopia. And um, what I think was really important was that this was a, their cultural values were about immersive and experiential quality, like privileging experience first.
So that's also part of the confusion too, because they weren't just simply left radicals, like you know, you know, Marxist radicals or something. It was completely different in the sense that they were trying to transform society, and the best way of doing that was to model its alternative. So that's how you get things like communes, for example, or alternate economies or free economies, to simply put out there the possibility of what if you had a store where everything in it was absolutely free? How would the rules of consumer behavior change? How would management change? Would there be a management? Would people uh, contribute things? Would it be part of a sharing economy? All of these things were modeled as alternative practices, and because they were real, meaning that you could participate in it, they also became very believable, and I think they planted the seeds of a lot of what we have today. Mm, it's beautiful, the, the way you put it, and, and uh, it almost makes me hate to get into some of the, well, what really happened, you know, how, how, how much influence does it have, how much have we stood the test of time, and um, you know, considering all the conversations about peace that were happening in the 60s, why do you think we've been, become so comfortable with just endless wars? Well, the endless war is more recent phenomenon, right? Starting uh, maybe in the late 80s, early 90s, the rock, um, rock one. Um, the, we have to remember that the Vietnam War turned on the, when people protested, right? That was not going to end well. They escalated and that created more protests. So it did come to a resolution at one point. There were also many things that people forget that were creative, like the Environmental Protection Agency that wants to be dismantled now. That was the creation of Richard Nixon in a Republican administration because they felt the pressure to do something about the environment because people don't want to drink poisoned water. They don't want to live next to factories belching smoke. Um, all the normal commonsensical things. So we have to remember that protest and is part of uh, democracy and democracy is how you get change. Mm. Worth the effort, for sure. So why do you think the utopian approach to civilization envisioned in the 60s has yet to be fully realized? You know, what, what might be our, our best course to finally arrive there? Well, you know, utopia by its nature is like an impossible dream. <laughs> but <laughs> the end of the rainbow. <laughs> right, exactly. But you can never really get there. But the, yeah. the point is to struggle for it, and that's how you transform society. So the idea is that society becomes better because of these because of these fights. And yes, there's going to be setbacks, like there were during the 80s, I believe, but you know, that in the long arc of history, there are certain values that will be, I think, more triumphant, and you just have to think of it in a bigger context. It's not just a set of skirmishes. Um, between different factions, that there's a long arc to all of this. Um, we mentioned earlier that climate change was first um, brought up um, by architects and designers in the 1960s, um, with the work of scientists, of course. Um, but that debate is still raging right now, right, with den climate deniers um, as being part of the political apparatus. But all of that is part and parcel of the messy democracy that we live in. Oh boy, if it's gonna be this messy, it sounds like the message is just promoting that struggle, that desire, just let's just at least desire utopia, right? Or desire your clean air, clean water, or yeah. not, uh, you know, a constant, uh, you know, climatic crises. Um, that, <laughs> that's all part of the, part of the effort, right? Part of the part of the larger movement, uh, more progressive pol political uh, history over the 20th century, <laughs> now into the 21st century. Any tips or suggestions how we can bring this this important cause back to the forefront? Um, well, I think in that idea of modeling, because I'm a designer by training, and so I think one of the powers of design is to create an alternate um, experience. You know, we live with alternate facts now, so what can we live with alternate <laughs> alternate solutions? Um, that would be the most powerful lesson, as and a lot of designers are interested in that. So a lot of the things that are happening in the contemporary world in design, humanitarian design, that was scoffed at back then, but it was birthed back then. And now most designers would put themselves squarely in that camp where they would not at all back then. So it takes a while. <laughs> mm, but that's be it's a beautiful note to end on is, is that lasting, resonating influence and impact that the, the, they, right. the culture of the 60s had that, that we still feel today. Yeah, because the values were universal and true, I think. We appreciate what you're doing here so much. Thank it's you. a great addition to all the uh, remembrance and celebration and commemoration of 50 years since that summer of love. Wow, 50 years, long time. Yeah. <laughs> On the subject of love at Seoul, we always love to wrap with a hug. Oh. <laughs>